Hey guys, uh, today we're going to be talking about Mill's utilitarianism. And the thing about utilitarianism is that the basic underlying principle for all of this stuff is going to seem fairly easy, in part because when you compare his uh, system to someone like Aristotle or Kant, it's less technical, it's less systematic even, right? Um, and also this basic principle is going to seem, I think, fairly intuitive. Uh, like I assume many of you, as we flesh this out, will think to yourself, oh, yeah, I kind of already thought that, even if I didn't know it. And what I'm going to say is, even though this principle seems easy, there's a, there's a lot more to it, right? There's some specifics to hash out, and I just want to make sure we don't try to reduce it to something that it's not. So that said, let's talk about Mill. He begins uh, the chapter by explaining how the history of ethics hasn't had so much progress. You know, when compared to something like science that saw this enlightenment that brought about uh, new technologies and advancements and how we live and all this good stuff, ethics hasn't had that privilege. In fact, he goes so far as to say that in 2,000 years, we're no better off than we were you know, than Socrates striking up conversations with people uh, in Athens. So a pretty harsh way to start, but maybe he has a point, I don't know. And then after that, he starts talking about something that maybe sounds a bit confusing. Because um, he wants to separate himself from other ethical theories. So he starts by pushing himself away from these people who he calls a priori moralists. And of course, he's talking about Kant when he refers to these people. So let's talk a little bit about what that means. So there's this word, uh, a priori. And it's usually used in logic or in epistemology to talk about knowledge, right? A priori knowledge. And this is in contrast to a different type of knowledge that's referred to as a posteriori. And the first thing I want you guys to know is that this isn't a. It's not like the priori. The a here is not um, an indefinite article. It's part of the word because it's Latin. So if you look at a priori, it means something like from the beginning, right? Or from the before, rather, I should say. From the prior, that makes sense. Whereas a posteriori means something like from the after, or from, from what is posterior. Now, what does this have to do with ethics? So, some kinds of knowledge have to do with principles, and definitions, and relations between concepts. Whereas other bits of knowledge have to do with things that concern the external world. And that's basically the difference here. So let's start with a posteriori knowledge, because maybe that's the easier one, and then we'll draw a contrast here. So a posteriori knowledge is knowledge that is gained after empirical verification. Now what does that mean? So empirical means that it's pertaining to your senses, like sight or listening or smell or touch or taste. So there's some pieces of knowledge you gain about the world because you're interacting with it through some kind of sense perception. So let's say I were to tell you it's sunny outside right now, and it happens to be the case. I'm not just saying that. So how do I know that? Well, I don't just know it by sitting here with my eyes closed and thinking about it being sunny. No, the only way I could know if it's actually sunny is by looking outside and seeing the sunlight, by going outside and feeling the warmth on my skin, right? Or similarly, you know, let's say we have this cup of tea and I drink it. I say, oh, that tea's still hot. How do I know that? Well, because I put it up to my mouth and then I could feel the heat and then I felt it kind of burn my tongue, right? So this is knowledge that's gained after empirical verification, after I interact with the world via the senses. But not all knowledge is like that. Some knowledge is gained prior to or before 
empirical verification. Meaning, you know the thing independently of your senses, right? Without having to go out in the world and interact via perception. And you might be wondering, wait, what's an example of that? How can you know something without looking at it or hearing it or going observing, right? Or checking out in the world. Here's an example. Two plus two is four. Right? When you're talking about two plus two is four, you're not making a claim about particular objects or events out in the world. Rather, you're issuing a statement about concepts and the relations between these concepts. And the reason you know this is correct is because you know the definition of two, you know the definition of addition, you know the definition of equals, and you know the definition of four. And so it's like once you have those basic definitional understandings, you can verify or falsify uh, this merely by thinking about the definitions. Similarly, let's say I said 2 plus 2 is 7. You would say, whoa, 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 that's wrong right off the bat. How do you know that? Again, because if you think about the definitions of the terms, this doesn't make sense. It's nonsensical. And another example of a piece of a priori knowledge would be to say triangles always have less sides than octagons, right? Again, how do you know that? It's not because you're going out into the world and like looking for all these triangles and octagons. No, it's because the concept of triangle means something. It means having three sides. And the concept of octagon is different. It means having eight sides. And so you can know always, merely rationally, by using thought, that triangles will have less sides than octagons. So this is kind of a very basic epistemological lesson here on two types of knowledge. The question is, how does this relate to the text? How does this relate to ethics? Well, Mill starts off the chapter by distancing himself from people who he deems a priori moralists. People like Kant, who attempt to make ethics a matter of, how could we say this, mathematical knowledge. They try to make ethics as basic as, you know, A is B, B is B, therefore A is C. I'm sorry, A is B, B is C, therefore A is C. And Mill wants to say ethics isn't like that. You can't mathematize things, because Kant, who we'll talk about later, you'll see, does treat ethics like that. He's going to say, okay, there are these basic principles, and once we understand these basic principles, we can think of every action and whether or not it satisfies these conditions. We can know ahead of time whether it's going to be ethical. And Mill says, no, that's not how we do things. Ethics isn't just formal. It's not just like math. It's not something where we could just look at structures and definitions and decide ahead of time whether we're doing the right thing. It's more complex than that. It's a posteriori knowledge, meaning we don't judge an action as moral or immoral merely based on whether it fits into some abstract ethical system, as someone like Kant will do. On the contrary, we judge actions as moral or immoral based on the consequences that the action produces. And so that's the first thing you want to know, is that utilitarianism is not an a priori system. It's a form of consequentialism. So consequentialism is this branch of ethics which states that we should judge actions not based on whether the action, let's say x is the action. I'll write it here. We don't judge the action based on whether or not the action fits into some mathematical system, uh, nor do we judge the action based on the motivation, right? Because you might be thinking, oh, we can tell someone's good or bad based on their intention. Mill doesn't believe that either. Instead, Mill believes 
that we should judge the action based on the result. It's like, I did this thing. Is it good? Is it bad? I don't know. What happened as a result of it? Tell me what the consequence was, right? If the consequence was good, then we call the action good. If the consequence was bad, then the action was bad. Of course, there's discrepancies with regard to like how people define good and bad, because there's different versions of consequentialism. For example, the egoist would say that an action is good if it results in you know, benefiting me, the I, right? Um, but all consequentialists are not equal. The particular type of consequentialism that we're discussing today is obviously utilitarianism. Let's make some room on the board here. So the question becomes, what does the utilitarian consider to be a good consequence? And thereby, what, consider, what does the utilitarian consider to be a good act? And this is where we get to the point where I said the principle seems kind of easy at first. So the thing underlying the utilitarian is the idea that an act is good to the extent that it produces happiness, right? The greatest good for the most amount of people. So when we're talking about utilitarianism, we're talking about the greatest amount of good for the greatest number of people. We can discuss that for a while. Seems intuitive, right? The right thing to do is whatever produces the greatest good, right? You hear this phrase, the greater good, all the time. Right? Sometimes you want to do something and you say, mm, maybe that'll benefit me, but it'll be better for more people if I don't do that thing. So you make that decision. Right? Maybe you're thinking like a utilitarian there. Excuse me. So the key thing, there's a couple key things to hash out here. Number one, when you look at this, you might think of something like democracy. You say, oh, democracy is based on utilitarian principles, right? It's like we choose to do the thing that more people voted for, what the majority thinks. So utilitarianism becomes a kind of majoritarianism. And it totally makes sense why you would say that. However, it's not exactly the case. Because there are some instances where the action pleases the most amount of people, does the most good for the most amount of people, and yet it's not the good for most people. So I'll give you an example of the exception here. Let's say we were all hanging out together and something happened, like someone broke into where we were and they were trying to hurt us. And I had a couple ways I could act. Way number, and let's say there's a total of 30 of us, right? Like a normal class size. Let's say there's 30 of us. Now, action A I could do will save me and five other people. Not bad, I get to save some people, right? However, there's another way I could act, and action B will save me and nine people. And those are my only choices. I could do something that's gonna save five in me, nine in me, or do nothing and then we're all gonna die. Now think about it, what would the utilitarian say? The utilitarian would say that action B, the one that saves you and nine people, is the better choice. Why? Because it produces a better outcome. Because it's the greater amount of people, right? It's the greater good for the greater number of people. But notice how nine isn't the majority, right? Nine isn't even half of 30. It's just more than the other action produces. So that's all I wanted to get through you guys' head that, yes, a lot of the time, it's about lining up with the majority, but it's not really that. It's a little more complicated than that. So now we're left with this principle of the greatest amount of good for the greatest number of people. And it's time to hone in on this concept of good because it's still quite vague. Like, how is he defining good? Clearly different ethical theories and ethical systems will define good in different ways. And if you look in the text, you know that Mill specifically 
is talking about happiness. So it's the greatest happiness principle. An action is good to the extent that it produces the most happiness for the most amount of people. Right? An action that produces more happiness will be better than an action that produces less happiness. That's what mill means. But the appropriate question to ask now that you might be thinking is, well, what does he mean by happiness? Okay, maybe we've defined good as happiness, but how are we defining happiness itself? And that's a good question to ask. And this next part is going to be key. Because Mill is going to define happiness in terms of these two interrelated qualities. The first one, he says, is something like the presence of pleasure. And the second one is absence of pain. So we're looking at right and wrong in terms of pleasure and pain. Right? Is there the presence of pleasure? Does pleasure exist as a result of this action? Or does pain exist? Right? Ideally, we'd want some kind of net pleasure. However, sometimes maybe there's no pleasure, but there's no pain. And that type of action will be better than one where there is pain. Right? So it's all like trying to uh, put these things together. We want pleasure and we want pain. Now, when you put this together with what we were saying before about greatest amount of happiness for the greatest number of people, you might be thinking, Oh, so it's a purely quantitative system, right? It's not mathematical in the sense that Kant's ethics is mathematical, again, who we'll talk about more. Um, but it's mathematical in the sense that it's just a numbers game. It's like, oh, whatever action produces more people's happiness is going to be the correct action. And Mill says no. He adds some interesting caveats, which is why I said it gets a little more interesting the more we unfold this thing. So yeah, it's about producing the most pleasure for the most amount of people, but it's not just about the quantity of pleasure. That's important, right? Like we want a higher quantity of pleasure, of course. However, we also care about the quality of the pleasure. In other words, pleasure isn't just one thing. There are different types of pleasures. And one of those types is worth more than the other type. And so if you think about it already, you'll know that if one is worth more than the other type, then a lesser amount of the one that's worth more could wind up being better than a greater amount of the one that's worth less. So there are these two types of pleasures Mill talks about, the higher pleasures and the lower pleasures. So the lower pleasures are easy. You can think of these as the more animalistic pleasures that humans have, right? Eating, drinking, sex, anything like that, right? Anything that we share with animals. These are the lower pleasures precisely because there's nothing uniquely human about them. It's like they're good, but they're not all you should live for, right? Like maybe sometimes it's okay to just lay on the couch watching Netflix eating ice cream, but that's clearly not what Mill has in mind when he's talking about how the world should be and how we can make everything better, right? Those are lower pleasures because we're basically no better than animals when we do that. And by the way, another portion of the chapter is dedicated to Mill explaining how what he's doing isn't the shallow type of hedonism that people accuse him of, right? People will say to Mill, well, you just want people to care about pleasure. You want people to just be like pigs and animals because no, no, no. If you're saying that, you're admitting to me that you think that humans aren't even capable of any higher pleasures. You think humans are not capable of that, so you actually are the one with the lower view of humanity. Mill, Mill says, no. We have those lower pleasures, the pleasures of the body, the sensory pleasures, that's another way to talk about this. But we also have 
these higher pleasures, and they're different. The higher pleasures are about the intellect. They're about the mind. For example, getting really good at a craft, maybe. Studying something uh, really rigorously and getting good at it. Becoming good at a sport over a long period of time. Getting your degree. Philosophy itself, even. Mill wants to say that these pleasures are worth more than the lower pleasures. But there's something interesting to note here. The lower bodily pleasures, those are immediate, right? You feel it as soon as you're eating or doing whatever you're doing. The higher pleasures, they're not so immediate. It's kind of like de delayed gratification. You're in it for the long game. So for example, if you're trying to study and pursue a degree to do something that involves your mind, it's not pleasurable in the moment when you're having to do all this work. In fact, that might be kind of annoying for you and really difficult. However, and you might say, oh, well, that involves pain, so it's not pleasurable, right? No, because it's not really pain, because at the end of the chain of the things you're doing, you are going to obtain a pleasure that justifies those intermediate steps that weren't in themselves pleasurable. So in terms of answering the question, how ought we act, right? How should we be, which is what ethics is all about, right? Mill wants to say we should act in ways that produce the greatest amount of pleasure and the greatest quality of pleasure for the most amount of people. That is the more full version of the, the greatest happiness principle, at least for Mill. Now, one thing you might be wondering is, wait a second. How can you make a distinction? Don't some people like some things more than others and people are going to have different preferences and therefore we can't call certain pleasures higher or lower or better or worse? Well, we can, Mill thinks, right? Because we don't want to fall back on relativism. Think of the last thing we talked about, right? In the beginning of the semester, we, we, we read this critique of relativism. And relativism is the idea that there, there is no objective truth, right? There's just beliefs about reality and none of them are better than another and none of them are, are more correct. And ethical relativism specifically says that there are no objectively true ethical beliefs. Everything's equally good. Everything's equally bad, which means everything's neither good nor bad. It's just beliefs and feelings, basically. And we saw the problem with that is that it seems like a nice thing to say, right? I don't want to judge people, right? I'm supposed to be nice. But it's actually not a sustainable position and you don't actually believe it because if you were a true relativist, that would mean you couldn't judge someone for coming in here and then like stabbing me for no reason, right? Because to judge is to believe in some kind of objective values. So the relativist way of thinking might say, oh, you can't distinguish between these, but Mill says, of course you can, that's silly. And he gives a test, a little thought experiment. He says, the reason you know these two are different, that these are worth more than these, are because if you've experienced both, if you've been on both ends, you're obviously going to say that these are worth more. No one who experiences both is going to say that the lower pleasures are of a higher quality, right? So maybe you're someone who goes out and parties all the time and like does drugs and has sex and eats copious amounts of food and just does all this stuff, right? And then you get to a point in your life where you're not doing that all the time. You're actually working your mind and doing something that you're proud of in the long term. He says, once you do that, you're not going to be like, hmm, you know, I think the other stuff I was doing was worth more. And if you do, he thinks, okay, well, maybe you're not being honest with yourself or you're just flat out wrong. And the example that I always think about when I'm trying to explain the difference between these two is imagine you have kids. Maybe some of you do have kids. If you don't, imagine that you do have kids. And imagine that you're walking with your kids through the city one day. And you're walking and you see two people that you're walking by. 
the one person is like not clean, homeless in the streets, doing drugs, sloppy, just doing a bunch of bad things. And the other person is someone who looks respectable, right? Someone who's like tidied up, someone who has a family, someone who has a good career, someone who you could tell is a real thinker and is doing positive things. Now pretend your kid asks you, oh, mommy, daddy, which one's better? Which one should I be like? What you're not going to say to your child is, oh, they're both equal. I would be equally happy if you wound up like either one. No, and you're not gonna promote your kid to wind up like homeless in the street doing drugs. Of course you're going to say, oh, that one is better, right? That one is of a higher quality. That's how you should strive to become, right? You wanna be closer to that than the other one. Same kind of thing. That's how you know that the, the intellectual pleasures are of a higher quality than the bodily pleasures. And this is not to say that you don't want these. Of course you want these, they're pleasure. It's just that you don't only want these. Life shouldn't only involve the bodily pleasures. Your life should seek to include both of them. And this sounds maybe a little bit like a balancing act, which sounds like Aristotle, who of course we'll talk about more in another video. Um, but Mill has this famous line at the end of the, the chapter, in the middle of the chapter, where he says, I would rather be a human dissatisfied than a pig satisfied. Or I would rather be Socrates unsatisfied than the fool, right? Satisfied and just like wallowing in my own filth. And this is exactly what Mill's talking about. Like, I would rather live a life unsatisfied pursuing these than live a life that is completely absent of higher pleasures and is merely uh, subsistent on these lower bodily pleasures. I'd rather be a human than a mere animal because intellect is the thing that separates the humans from animals. So if our goal is to be the best human that we can be, we should strive to do all of the things that pleasure can offer and not just the things that we share with animals. Uh, and that's utilitar utilitarianism in a nutshell, right? It's the greatest amount of, it's a consequentialist ethical philosophy who considers good consequences to be those that produce the greatest uh, amount of happiness, which we know is the amount and quality of pleasure for the most amount of people. So we can stop now for there. Uh, as always, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to email me. I'm always here to help. Have a good day.